Hey, in case you didn't read the beginning, today's show is about the new Quentin Tarantino movie and it has spoilers in it. If you haven't seen the movie and or don't want to know what the big twisty stuff is yet, this ain't the episode to watch right now. Last warning. Okay, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is the new hit movie from Quentin Tarantino, and as expected, it came with some controversy. But unlike literally everything he's made before this time, in fact, right up until it's not, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is graded on a curve against other Tarantino films, probably his tamest work in terms of content. Not as much colorful profanity, not as much violence, though there is some much more drama than action and much more long atmospheric people driving in cars around 1960s Los Angeles listening to classic rock wordless stretches to balance out the banter, plus most of the obligatory obscure movie references are integrated more organically than usual because the film takes place in the film industry of the past directly. So instead, this time what's gotten people into an uproar and choosing upsides and all that is less about the visual content than it is about the narrative content, specifically the fact that the film not only takes place in the past, but during a very specific period, intersects with the lives of several prominent real-life figures of that period, and remember, I did warn you about spoilers, that it gradually reveals itself to be a work of alternative historical fiction. In other words, that the once upon a time part isn't just there to be cute. Set primarily during three specific days spread across 1968 and 1969, the main character is Leonardo DiCaprio's Rick Dalton, a once famous TV cowboy actor who, largely because of the changing taste and style in leading men, is having difficulty transitioning to the big screen as anything other than a typecast B-movie tough guy, increasingly reliant both on and off screen on the backup of his best friend and stunt double Brad Pitt's Cliff Booth, an army veteran possessed of near superhuman physical abilities and a shady past. Rick also happens to be living next door to Margaret Margot Robbie is real-life actress Sharon Tate. Here is in reality portrayed as a rising next big thing star hot off the success of Valley of the Dolls, wife of then-celebrated young filmmaker Roman Polanski, and essentially a walking symbol of the hip, cool new Hollywood Rick is desperate to ascend to, but clearly not meant to be a true part of. Other real-life figures of the time appear as supporting characters or get name-checked, including Steve McQueen, Bruce Lee, various figures of the Italian exploitation film business. Oh, and of course also Charles Manson and the Manson family, the deranged cult of LA area transient grifters squatting on the dilapidated movie ranch where actors like Rick and Cliff once worked and who, in the real-life version of events, attained terrible infamy with the home invasion murders of Tate, her unborn child, and several others at their home in 1969, an event which shocked the nation and is often framed by pop history as both the moment where the American culture turned hard against the 1960s flower children demographic. Manson, of course, wasn't actually a hippie, quote-unquote. He was a white supremacist with a delusional fantasy of staging murders to trigger an apocalyptic race war, but that's another show, and also sometimes as the official point of no return for the traditional Hollywood studio and star system mystique, i.e. the spectacle of a young actress viewed by many as the next big all-American it girl movie star dying in so horrible a fashion amid the general collapse of interest in traditional studio-driven star movies of the time, but in Once Upon a Time's version of history, that's not what happens. Instead, the Manson family killers get distracted on their way to the Tate house by recognizing Rick from the TV and decided to be more interesting to kill a TV cowboy instead, and Cliff, who earlier in the film had encountered the family at the ranch and knows more or less what they're about, or at least suspects such, basically beats them to death with his bare hands because he's a roughneck anti-hero with a potentially dark past played by Brad Pitt in a Quentin Tarantino movie, and Rick is not those things, but he does own a flamethrower. The killings are thus thwarted, Tate and her friends survive without even finding out that they were ever in danger in the first place, and it turns out they're fans of Rick's, implicitly winning him access to continued life on the Hollywood A-list after all. Happy ending! I mean, maybe? Charles Manson himself is technically still out there, and we never do find out if Cliff is actually guilty of the bad thing he may or may not have done in his past, but Tarantino movie. Anyway, as you may gather, once critics and early audiences were done picking their jaws up from the surprise finish, many began to question whether or not using real-life murders for a twist like this is an incredibly poor taste, particularly considering the uniquely misogynistic brutality of Tate's butchering and Tarantino's not exactly tasteful history with violence against women as a plot device in general. It's an interestingly uncomfortable question that I'm not really sure has an objective answer, especially since these alternate history what-if takes, where Tarantino's extremely latent talent for or something like introspective self for critique often tends to come up. One could argue that it's gauche to appropriate real-world tragedy for what amounts to a happy ending revenge fantasy, which is an argument that was in fact made about both Django Unchained and Inglorious Bastards, both of which carried the additional concern of appropriation, i.e. what claim does Quentin Tarantino, a white writer-director originally from Knoxville, Tennessee, have in imagining historic revenge fantasies for crimes committed against black and Jewish people? On the other hand, one could just as easily argue that such persons have greater claim to say whether or not the appropriation is in fact offensive or even appropriative in the first place. Tarantino's interesting relationship adjacent to black American movie culture is practically its own entire field of film study, and he himself was so uncharacteristically concerned about possibly crossing a line in Bastards that he consulted on specific aspects with Jewish co-star Eli Roth and his family, with Roth's father Sheldon eventually penning an editorial for the Jewish Journal comparing the film's use of historic fantasism to the emotional history of biblical recitations of Passover. In that context, one might look to Tate's sister Deborah, who was consulted on the making of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and has been very approving of the film overall, particularly Robert's performance as her sister and Tarantino's decision to focus on her day-to-day -day ordinary life instead of celebrity encounters or work 
work, along with completely extricating her from the murders, which apparently was the deliberate point, i.e. a writing of wrongs fantasy that doesn't simply let her survive, but also prevents the Manson murders from overwhelming, or becoming, or even touching her story so that Sharon Tate's life can be about her life once again, an approach of, I mean, let's be honest, disconcerting maturity from Quentin Tarantino from a certain point of view. Then again, the flip side of that is that while Tate is no longer a dead body in the history of the August 8th and 9th, 1969, she's also no longer a central figure in the story. Instead, it becomes the story of two fictional cowboy heroes and a dog who save the day by violently slaughtering three almost hilariously outmatched attackers, two of which are much younger women. And while there's a compelling magnanimity to the idea of Tarantino at least symbolically returning agency to this alternate timeline version of Tate, it also feels like a happy ending for him more so. In this timeline, the Mansons don't get to taint the idyllic, if cheesy, Los Angeles vibe of then six-year-old Tarantino's youth, and instead of signaling the end for real of a Hollywood where old-school movie heroes like Rick Dalton could be the stars driving them into the wilderness of spaghetti westerns and B-movies where they'd become cult icons to be loved and eventually resurrected by nostalgic Gen X ironists like Quentin Tarantino, in case this was all too subtle, two guys like that get to save the day, potentially meaning an entirely different pop culture history, one perhaps more preferable to Tarantino's sensibility. Plus, if one takes Tate's sister's word as close to definitive, then similar consideration ought to go to the wife and daughter of the late Bruce Lee, who've criticized the late martial arts legend's depiction in the film from a story and character perspective while praising the performance of actor Mike Moe in the role. Lee appears in two flashback scenes in Once Upon a Time, one based in reality where he trains Sharon Tate in Kung Fu for her fight scene in The Wrecking Crew, and another made up for the film where he and Cliff have an impromptu sparring match several years before the main storyline on the set of The Green Hornet after Cliff takes exception to Lee's claim that he could easily defeat heavyweight champ Cassius Clay, then not yet named Muhammad Ali, in a fight. In the scene where Lee first comes off as a cocky, self-assured showman, he at first easily knocks Cliff down but then gets thrown himself after they start really throwing hands with the fight effectively being stopped in a draw by show producers before we can find out who would have actually won. According to Mo himself, he had the same concerns, but was of the opinion and acted the scene in the context that his Lee would have won the fight in the next round. Obviously, given the literally godlike status Bruce Lee holds in the martial arts community and pop culture in general, a lot of fans were unhappy to see him depicted as anything other than unbeatable, which is clearly the point. Using the audience's cultural foreknowledge of Bruce Lee as a force of nature to establish Cliff's nearly superhuman physicality for later, which also feels like a deliberate flex by Tarantino. You can almost feel his encyclopedic film nerd excitement at the chance to correct people that, you know, well, actually, guys, at this point in his career, even Lee would later say he was too much of a hothead and didn't always win. He was only two years out from demonstrating the one-inch punch for the first time in the Americas in public. The fight with Wong Jack Man had only been about that much time in the past. He hadn't yet opened the Jun Fen Gun Kung Fu Institute, uh, developed Jeet Kune Do yet. He wouldn't even become a superstar in Hong Kong for another five years, so, you know. Violence is everywhere in our society, you know? It's like even in breakfast cereals, man. <laughs> Film writer Walter Chaw, however, writing for Vulture, describes enjoying the film as a serious fan of Lee's personally invested in portrayals of Asian men in mainstream film. And while he understands the Lee family's objections, especially given that many audiences and critics have mischaracterized Moe's spot-on replication of Lee's outsized mannerisms and screen affect as a kind of parody, he views the portrayal as similar to that of Robbie's Tate, i.e. rehumanizing a pop culture figure whom history had transformed into something of an unknowable, untouchable icon. Chaw also notes the apparently true fact that prior to the capture and confession of the Manson family, Lee's self-propagated superhuman image was so pervasive even in Hollywood that Roman Polanski briefly suspected him of having committed the Tate House multiple murders himself, which is much more bizarre than anything present in Once Upon a Time. <laughs> yeah kind of heavy stuff. Like I said, this is tough because it's hard to have a fair definitive answer. I don't find either of the big historical flights of fancy in the film to be morally objectionable, and I'm not trying to push you listeners in one direction or the other, but I understand why others do, and I recognize no standing to say either of the opinions of the family members in this case are right or wrong in that view. This is why historical fiction is often hard to parse critically, because it forces us to confront how much we take for granted with normal history narratives and film in general, but people should be able to hash these things out and have disagreements about it without it descending into an all-out war, and this time because it's about story and content and history and interpretations rather than on-screen violence or on-screen sex, it seems to be mostly civil. That at least is a nice change. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Mm -hmm.